from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening today. It's so great to be here with you. It is a 48-degree day in Maple Grove, Minnesota, and the forecast is not looking so great. So I would say that today is the last day, last nice day to get the outside work done. I saw a ton of neighbors putting up Christmas lights. It's a lot easier to put those things on the trees when your hands aren't freezing cold. Well, I have a great show for you today. Joel Karsten is back and he is going to be sharing the steps to successful straw bale gardening. It's a method that he has spent over 20 years refining and it is a method that's been called breakthrough and pioneering for so many gardeners facing adverse situations, whether it's a limited growing season, or no space to garden. So it's going to be a great show. Before we get to the blog post for the week, I do want to take a minute to ask for your help. If you could take the time to give the Still Growing Podcast a rating on iTunes, I really do appreciate the folks who take the time to listen to Still Growing and listener reviews help the show stay visible within the iTunes directory so more people can find the podcast. So if you'd like to do that, I would really appreciate it. It's pretty straightforward. Just look the show up on iTunes and there's a little button to click that says leave a rating and review. And in fact, I'll leave a link to iTunes in the show notes uh, for this episode. The show notes are located on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you'll find the Still Growing Podcast in the top menu. And if you're so inclined, you can go through all of the archives and see the shows that have been done. There are many wonderful and talented folks who've spent time and shared their wisdom on Still Growing. And all of that is available on the website. You can also become a fan of the show at facebook.com backslash still growing with six foot mama. On my blog this week, the view from up here is shared in a post called Three Seasons. It's been tough to get serious about the holidays when the weather has been so indecisive. Earlier this month while I was walking sunny, I took a photo I call Three Seasons. It's a picture of this glorious layout of three seasons, summer, fall, and winter, and they're all intermingled beneath a maple tree. Green grass, golden leaves, and little clumps of snow. And all of them are together laying on top of each other like my little guys when they're playing Xbox. Have you ever noticed how difficult it can be to get in a groove when seasonal shifts are slow to establish? Today is the 20th of November, and yet I'm going to run the lawnmower one more time to mulch the last of the fallen leaves. And in any other year, the lawnmower would be long since winterized. Of course, it's Minnesota and folded away under the garage deck, but not this year. And it's a good thing that Thanksgiving is late this year because 2013 is taking its sweet time to wrap things up. Speaking of wrapping things up, the kids have finished their first quarter of school and were well into the established routines for homework, supper, and bedtime. Last week, the little boys got their school pictures back and I broke all kinds of fashion laws by making them wear matching outfits. What can I say? It was just easier. The night before pictures, I received a reminder email from the school. Thank you, Trish. And suddenly I felt the need to try and make the little turkey look presentable. And there I was scrambling around Kohl's at 9 p.m. on a school night. And the only viable shirt and sweater combination that I could find happened to be available in matching colors in their two sizes. Lucky for me, the boys were oblivious to their matching ensembles. And I don't know how I managed to get a pass on that one, but I did. 
John looked sweet as pie in his second grade photo. Sadly, his smooth and even baby teeth have been falling out. And this year, he's got a new smile with new front teeth that look a little too big for his sweet little head. And he's still got his cowlick. I see his hair broke free of the gotta be glued hair gel that was supposed to keep everything in place. But the picture really does look like how John looks every day. PJ's in fourth grade, and you can tell by his smile that he's a charmer. He ditched the glasses that he insisted on having last year. The poor eye doctor finally gave in and just got him a pair that didn't offer really any correction. But he no longer wants to wear them, and this is his first picture school picture without glasses, but with braces. And by the way, I can't believe that I have three kids in braces. Don't forget it's basketball season and we're up to our Gatorades and practices and games. John's basketball picture is on the website and we just wrapped up eight weeks of basketball with him. He'll be playing again in the winter and we can tell that he has really benefited from having older brothers at home to teach and play with him because he knows what he's doing out there even though he's just seven. PJ is starting his basketball season and he's had the same coach for three years and he gets to have his best friend on his team again this year. And in PJ's world, there's nothing better than being with friends and playing sports. And all through the week, I get to hear, where is my practice? When is my game? Where is my jersey? You get the idea. In the garden this week, my mom has started her outdoor decorating. I am so jealous. I have been so busy and so inundated with technical issues that I haven't had a chance to even begin to get outside and start putting my planters together. Aside from spurring me on to get going on my own planters, I love that she is using the sumac seed heads and pine cones from her daily walks in the woods with dad. Her spruce top planter turned out really lovely. It's very very simple, but it's very elegant. And she also put together a swag for her mailbox. And I'll have pictures of both of them on the blog this week. And I, I don't think there's anything sweeter than going out into nature and harvesting items from the woods to use in your own containers. Two weeks ago, I started my indoor bulbs and my first batch of paper whites are blooming in the front room. Those babies come up so quickly and my new motto for paper whites is all winter long. I am going to be planting paper whites until Phil's birthday in March. And that's going to be St. Patrick's Day, so you can hold me to it. But last month, I bought nearly 300 paper white bulbs, enough to last me well through the winter. And needless to say, I love them, love them, love them. Throughout the year, I've been collecting petite containers to use specifically for these paper whites because I'm, my idea is that I want to provide small punches of color, life, and fragrance around the house. I love having them in powder rooms, and there is absolutely nothing better than waking up to a small bouquet of blooming paper whites beside your bed every morning. So I'm very excited to try the new arrangements in the coming months. And just an FYI, this first batch is potted in dirt. The bulbs were potted in dirt very shallowly and without overwatering. They are standing up as straight as can be. And I've talked to so many gardeners who have given up on paper whites because they kind of tend to flop. And with very judicious and restrained watering, these paper whites are doing just fine and I'm having no tipping issues with them. At Everest Lane House, since the weather has been cooperating, I decided to update our outdoor lights. And boy, did I find some lights that I absolutely love. Not only are they great looking, but they are some of the easiest lights I have ever installed. They get a a in my book. And I can't wait to share them with you. I got them at Home Depot and I'll tell you all about them in the blog post I'm writing for tomorrow. I've had some amazing luck at Goodwill this month. One of my favorite finds is this 1936 volume book set and they're absolutely stunning. They're brown with uh, green and gold gilding and I plan to use them on my mantle for Christmas. Later this week, I'm going to be sharing my step-by-step -step process for making stunning mantlescapes. And I'll outline some tips that I use to make a narrow mantle ledge larger 
and ways that I incorporate to add dimension. In our guest room, also known as the port room, I finally curated enough ship art (laughs) to create the gallery I've always envisioned for the media wall. This was a super fun project and I'm very happy with how it turned out. So if you're a fan of ships, genealogy, and all things nautical, you'll want to check it out. Last but not least, on this week's Still Growing, as I mentioned earlier, I'm featuring part two of my interview with Joel Karsten, and this show covers the how-to of straw bale gardening. And I don't think Joel leaves anything out, but if you do decide that you want to do it or you want to recommend it to some of your garden friends and family, consider getting Joel's New York Times best-selling book, Straw Bale Gardens, for Christmas present. It's clearly written, it's very thorough, and it's chock full of tips. I myself have purchased two copies and I've got two gardeners in mind for this book. As I mentioned in part one, Joel and I share the same hometown. And as it turns out, our families have some connections that we've had fun discovering this month. And my mom knew right where to find the photo of both of our dads dressed up as clowns for the town's Turkey Day Parade back in 1966. And as I say on my blog, because I show the photograph at the end of this post, and again, this particular post is called Three Seasons. So Joel's dad and my dad are together in this picture. And as I say in this blog post, it's not every day that a gal gets to say, my dad is the clown on the right. And that's the view from up here this week. So let's get into the meat of the show with Joel, America's straw bale gardening expert and author. He has helped thousands of gardeners with his breakthrough method of gardening. And his best selling book, Straw Bale Gardens, guides readers through the specific steps to successful straw bale gardening to help them counter challenging climates, less than ideal gardening situations, and the time and physical demands of a traditional garden. In his career, Joel has been a successful entrepreneur and a lifelong gardener. Faced with his own challenging site for gardening after he bought his first home, Joel conducted his own research and found that straw bales could be a life-changing tool for today's gardener and their families, giving them a longer growing season and providing a sterile weed-free environment for vegetables and plants. With straw bale gardens, gardeners have an easy, proven way to garden, enjoying higher yields without soil concerns. It can be either 100% organic or conventionally tended, and in almost any location, even driveways and balconies. People frequently assume that straw bale gardening simply means sticking plants in a straw bale. Equally off base would be gardeners who hollow out a straw bale and fill it with soil, turning their straw bale into a container. Neither of these methods is straw bale gardening. What Joel has developed through his 20 years of gardening with straw bales is a proven method to transform ordinary straw bales into a viable substrate for growing plants. In this week's podcast, I resume my chat with Joel Karsten about the specific steps to successful straw bale gardening. Uh, We're resuming our chat about straw bale gardening. Let's chat uh, specifically about straw. Tell us everything you know about straw. Give us a primer. (laughs) Well, this is a very common question I get. Whenever I speak to groups, especially, I always tell people the closer you get to the country's tallest buildings, the harder it is for the audience to distinguish the difference between straw and hay. So that's the first thing we always need to start with is the difference between straw and hay. When we talk about straw for our purposes, we're really talking about uh, oats, wheat, and in our part of the country, barley, um, any of the cereal grains or the small grain crops. Um, the, the grain is, is cut at the ground level and the seeds are removed. That becomes oatmeal and wheaties, etc. And the stalk is what is baled up uh, for agricultural use as normally as animal bedding material. Whereas hay is usually either baled grass that has the seeds on it or baled alfalfa, and it's used as and the seeds are left in the bale, and it's used as fodder for livestock. So there's a big difference. Bales of straw are going to be sterile. They're not going to have seed heads in them, whereas bales of hay are going to be loaded with seeds. 
Um, that's a, one of the basic differences between straw and hay. One's yellow. Straw is yellow or golden color, and hay bales are usually green or um, some shade of off green. Um, hay is usually heavier than straw is. Um, it's usually more expensive, at least in our part of the country. Hay is more expensive than straw. So straw is usually bedding material. It has hollow stems, which make, which make it uniquely... Um, it makes it uniquely shaped to hold moisture really well because the hollow stems allow moisture and water to, to get sucked up inside of these hollow stems. It's just a basic principle of physics that causes that. It draws the moisture up into these hollow stems of straw, and then the moisture can't get back out. That's why farmers for thousands of years have used straw as animal bedding material because it's so absorptive. It, it literally wicks up moisture and allows, of course, the farmer then to send his son in there to take the pitchfork and scoop all that straw into a manure spreader and haul it to the field. So, <laughs> um, that's really the life cycle of straws. It's harvested, um, used as bedding material, and usually brought back out to the field and, and dug back into the soil, along with now the, the manure and other things that come with it to, to replenish the nutrients back out in the field. So it's a renewable resource. You know, We'll, we'll never run out of it. Farmers grow it every year. Um, and it's actually good for the environment, good for the soil to use it as bedding material or use it and then bring it back out and reintroduce it back to the soil. So when you think about the straw being inside the straw bale, I was always under the impression that those hollow straws were just full of air and that it was just a really uh, porous, aerated straw bale. But what you're saying is that the inside of those tubes ends up kind of holding water. Exactly. They fill up with moisture. If you take a dry bale of straw that might weigh 50 pounds, by the time it's done absorbing water and has absorbed as much as it can, the bale will weigh well over 100 pounds. And an average size straw bale will hold easily from 5 to 7 gallons of water inside that straw bale. Uh, so it has an amazing capacity to capture and hold moisture, uh, which is what gives straw its, you know, its natural ability uh, to, to hold moisture and what makes it so good at being animal bedding and makes it really good for our purposes as well uh, to be used in, in our, you know, obviously when you're going to put plants in there and the roots need moisture and that straw bale is going to hold lots of moisture inside inside the bale itself. So it's a good reservoir for, for roots later on in the season. And then um, talk to people about the sterile environment because this is really what is setting the stage for your method to provide basically weed-free gardening, which is, I think, right. the, which is the tagline I think a lot of people are very incredulous about. Right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes people look at a picture or they read something about it and they see something about straw gardening and they, they assume that, well, you just take a bale of straw and you plant plants in it or... Some people think that you dig the inside of the straw of the straw bale out, and you fill it up with dirt, and then you plant in there. And as I try to explain to people, it's really not what we're doing because if you did that, you'd be traditional, you'd be soil gardening on top of or inside of a straw bale. You wouldn't get all the advantages that we get of using the straw itself to create the media. Um, we think about the outside of the bale as the crust, and that crust of the bale that's exposed to sunlight and and wind on an everyday basis. Even if you soak the straw bale with water, the outside of that straw bale, the crust, dries out very quickly. And because it dries out, it decomposes real slowly. Whereas the inside of the straw bale is going to decompose very rapidly, especially when we feed those bacteria that are the main decomposers inside of that bale. We feed those bacteria to encourage this decomposition process. And very rapidly, what we look at and see and you can touch and feel looks like straw within a couple of weeks is going to start to become soil. Uh, when people look around and, and look at what is good soil, usually they have a certain picture in their head of what soil is, and it's usually black in color and it has that certain smell and feel. And really good, rich soils are really high in organic material, decomposed organic material. What we're going to do is we're going to make 100% decomposed organic material. There's not going to be any minerals in terms of rocks or sand or anything like that in, in the bale. It's just going to be the humus or the decomposed organic material, which is really the good part of soils anyway. Um, and we're going to make that soil every spring out of our virgin bale of straw. What this does, of course, is it eliminates any need for crop rotation. Um, 
I always tell people, you know, read any book on vegetable gardening ever written. There's always a chapter in that book that's called or somehow titled The Importance of Crop Rotation. And they spend that entire chapter talking about how important it is that you don't plant cabbage in the same soil year after year because you're going to develop insect problems. And and they'll talk about tomatoes, how you can get disease, carry over from one year to the next. And it's usually soil-borne, so it stays in the soil from one year to the next. We don't worry about that because we're building brand new virgin soil inside this bale of straw. It's essentially sterile. There's no pre-existing virus or or fungal problems or insect problems in that bale. Um, and we're, there's no seeds in there either. So um, like in your typical soil in your garden for in the last 10 years while your neighbor's dandelions have gone to bloom and the little white particles have floated over and landed on your garden, you got all kinds of weed seeds in there. And it doesn't matter what you do, you can never get rid of all those weed seeds. Every year you till your garden, you try to keep it clean, and the next year there's just more weeds come back. We have an environment that's brand new soil, so there are no weed seeds down inside. Now, you may get a couple of dandelions that will float over during the summer and might sprout on top, but it's a very small percentage in comparison to traditional gardening. So your grandma Josephine would have had nothing to do over the winter because she wouldn't have needed to even plan her crop rotation. True, yes, her crop rotation, her, her planting plan took her half of the half of the winter. And, you know, it's, that's a, it's a fact that in, in, for lots of new gardeners, when I dub newbie gardeners, one of the biggest difficulties they have is, okay, how do I lay out my garden? And then when you start talking to them about, okay, well, next year you can't use the same layout because you need to rotate everything so you don't use the same soil. Oh, man, it just starts to blow their mind and they can't figure out, well, you know, how many years rotation between this crop and that crop. And then pretty soon they've got tall stuff shading the short stuff and it gets very confusing it's really easy with straw because you don't have to worry about that there's no crop rotation we don't worry about that as long as you know you're starting with fresh bales every spring you don't worry about what was planted in that bale last year because you're you're starting with a brand new bale so it really doesn't matter and the point is to really start with a new bale every year right you wouldn't reuse a bale Right. I, I do, you know, if, if people buy really big bales of straw, what I mean by that is, you know, ones that are really compressed, um, tightly compressed, and they're actual large bales that have been made by, you know, a big, good-sized baler, sometimes you can get a second year out of a bale. Um, that in, in some cases, you'll be able to look at your bales at the end of the first year and you'll say, there's no way I could use that bale again because it's kind of tipped over and kind of munched down and almost like a little pile of compost, you know you can use that bale again. But there are some situations where if you buy big enough bales and you don't plant root crops that you need to break the bale open to get them out. You know, if you put potatoes in a bale, you're pretty much done at the end of the year because you're going to break that bale open to get the potatoes out. Um, If you just plant crops that are going to grow on the surface, tomatoes, that kind of stuff, you might be able to grow something a second year in that bale. But your problems don't really come in two years anyway. Usually, the soil borne issues are going to come over many years, you know, using that same soil over and over. So you can actually, in some circumstances, use a bale a second year. I don't want to give people the impression that you can't, um, because I very often I get people that do that, especially as you get further south. Um, their climate's a little easier on the bales, and, you know, they don't have to go through a winter with heavy snow and all that kind of stuff like we do up here. So oh, okay. I didn't even think about that. that. Yeah. You know, yeah, that makes sense. And then for the people that are able to experience something like that, what do we Minnesota people know about things like that? But in the event that you were ever able to carry over that bale one more winter, what would you notice between year year two and year one? What are some of the things that you maybe would encounter in that second year, that a first year well, or a one time? Year, yeah, your second year bale, you're not going to have to do any conditioning at all. You're going to see the bales basically ready to plant as soon as the you know, weather gets nice. Um, just like you would plant your normal garden, you can plant right in it. And I never recommend people put their, their long season crops, the stuff that takes a long time to get mature, like tomatoes in this climate uh, and other crops like, um, some of your squash and watermelon and pumpkins, things that are a long season. You want those in a first year bale and you want to put things in a second year bale, like that are shorter season, like potatoes is a good example, and peas and beans and broccoli and cauliflower, things that get have a short duration, short life cycle, um, and they don't need the extra heat that's coming out of the bale. Because remember, one of the key advantages to the whole method is 
that first year bail as it's decomposing is going to get really warm, especially early in the season. It gets hot, actually, when you begin that conditioning process. And one of the things that we do to really take advantage of that heat is we plant earlier, and we can do that because we have this heater running inside the bale. This decomposition that's happening by the bacteria heats that bale up. And then it allows us to plant a little bit earlier, and that, and that heater inside that bale protects our plants from the cold weather, from any potential frost. And what it also does is it speeds up the early season root production inside that bale and tends to cause our plants to grow a little quicker earlier in the year. Um, I always tell people, if you compare May 15th, especially in, right here in Minnesota where we are, if you went out and checked the soil temperature on May 15th, you're going to get about a 50, 52 degree reading in most scenarios at, you know, four or six inches deep in the soil. Whereas if you started conditioning your straw bales on the 1st of May, by the 15th of May when you go to plant, they're probably going to be right around 100 degrees inside that bale. Now, when you put a tomato in the ground, that's 50 degrees versus in a bale, that's 100 degrees. That tomato loves warm feet, loves warm roots. And it's going to start growing, you know, lots of roots and putting on top growth only when that soil, ground soil, gets warmed up. So if I were to plant it on May 15th, I might come back a week later in the soil and I've got one leaf. You know, another week I got one more leaf. I come back three days after that and finally the soil warmed up and that tomato took off and started growing. When I plant it in the straw bale, I come back a week later, it's going to have eight inches of growth on it already because it just hits that warm environment and starts putting on roots right away. I bet people can't believe it the first time they see that. I Sometimes I still can't believe it. I mean, I tell people, you know, I've been doing this forever, and every spring when I go to plant and I reach my hand down inside that bale and I feel how warm it is, or I stick my thermometer in the side and I see the temperature go up to 100, 102 degrees, and I think, this is just amazing. But it, every year, it always works. It's the exact, you know, Mother Nature has a strange way about her, and it always works, and it warms up. That straw bale is always going to be warmer than your surrounding soil, than your, than typically than your surrounding air temperature at that top, at that time of year. Usually about 10, 15 degrees warmer. What planning is required to start straw bale gardening? So for first timers out there listening, what can they do right now to start planning for a straw bale garden next year? I would suggest they get their straw bale. You know, you know, they're much easier to find typically in the marketplace in the fall. Farmers have cut their oats and wheat over the past probably two to three weeks. Most of the wheat is just being cut right now in, in you know, the end of August, beginning of September. And the, the straw is therefore being baled right now. And what the farmer likes is to bring it right to the retail market and sell it right there, rather than having to put it in storage and then later on take it back out of storage and then bring it to the retailer. So the market over the next two or three months until the snow is way steep here is going to be, there's going to be plenty of straw bales available for sale. Whereas if you wait until spring, now it can be harder to find straw bales. Um, sometimes people think, well, what am I going to do with them all winter? And what I encourage people to do, if you buy your straw bales in the fall, is put them right out in the garden where you're going to use them. You don't cover them. You don't have to worry about that. Just let them weather. As long as you turn them so that the strings are not touching the ground, your strings will stay intact, um, especially if they're the, the the nylon strings, if you use sisal twine and they get wet, you know, it can start to decompose like anything. But as long as you tip them sideways, they'll last fine through until spring and then move the shrubbles into their final position where you want them for your garden and then begin the conditioning process. And, you know, they'll have been rained on and snowed on and the snow will have melted and the bales will be nice and wet and waterlogged and they'll have started a little bit of conditioning, but they really don't go to town until you start to add that nitrogen source. And that really feeds them and feeds that bacteria and starts the rapid process of decomposition. Tell people a little bit more about what you mean when you say don't let the strings touch the ground, because I know that there are people out there that just have no idea what you're talking about. Well, there are string, the strings are going to run around the bales in one direction. And I like, you know, especially for storage and, and when, even when we plant them, and the way I like to orient the bales is so that the edge of the bale is touching the ground and the other edge is facing up. So the strings are running around the sides of the bale. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's not the flattest way you could lay the bales. It's kind of up on edge. But if you put them up on edge like that, it, it actually gives you more planting surface because when we plant, we're going to plant not only what then would be the top of the bale, 
but we're also going to plant the sides of the bales. So if you laid it flat, you have two short sides and one wide flat part, whereas if you tip it up on the edge, you have one short top, but you have two long flat sides. So it becomes, it gives you more surface, more square inches to plant if you tip it up on edge like that long way. Okay. Uh, and that's a good way, you know, you can put it right out in the garden where you're actually going to position it and use it. The problem is if you buy your bales right now and you're already a straw bale gardener, you already have bales in your garden and you're, you know, you're still picking tomatoes and, you know, your pumpkins probably aren't quite ready to, to harvest yet. So your garden's still in production. So even if you get your bales now and stack them up just on the corner somewhere of your garden, um, but just stack them so that the strings don't don't touch the soil. That's the main thing. Okay, don't I see. put them in your garage. I always tell people, don't store them in your garage. Don't put them in your tool shed. Because if you do that, you're just making a mouse hotel. Mice love a nice dry bale of straw. Now what mice don't like is a wet bale of straw. So once that bale of straw gets rained on and snowed on, in the next spring, you're going to start watering it and fertilizing it. No, no mice are going to be interested in living in that straw bale simply because it's completely soggy and wet all the time and it's not a conducive environment uh, for them to reproduce and there's no food in it. You know, all the seeds have been harvested. So you don't, I tell people, you don't see any more mice in a straw bale garden than you do in a traditional garden. You know, hmm. every once in a while you'll see a field mouse running around, but it's no more in a, in a regular garden or in a straw bale garden. Let's say I get one of these bales and I set it in an area of my garden where I've already got some plant material. Maybe it's something I'm, I'm like, I don't care about that anymore. Let's put the straw bale back there, and that's where my garden will be. Do I have to worry about things growing up from the ground into my straw bale and taking over well, that way? You know, if you put if you put bales right over the top of it, it's going to suffocate and kill whatever's underneath it just okay. because it you know, won't get any sun anymore, and it, you know, it shades it out, and they'll get rid of it. If you put them right on your lawn, it's going to kill the grass underneath yeah. those straw bales. After a couple of weeks, your grass is going to die. Um, but as far as something growing all the way up through it, that, you know, it's probably not going to happen. Okay. You know, unless you do it on, you know, unless you plant it there on purpose and it has a good amount of energy in that seed pot or like, for instance, potatoes are something that you plant deep in the straw bale and they'll actually grow all the way up. But they've got, you know, when you plant a big chunk of potato, you've got all this starchy reservoir there that's going to feed that potato until the stem reaches the surface where then it can start photosynthesis. So. Huh. So let's get to the heart of the matter, which is the conditioning of the bales. And I know uh, from our conversation uh, earlier today in the first part of our interview that that really is a process that you have really developed and honed over time, a very scientific approach. Um, is this the most intimidating part of straw bale gardening for folks? And then can you break it down for first-time straw bale gardeners? Yes, I can break it down. It, it, it's probably not the most intimidating, but for most people, for many people, it can be confusing only because they tend to get, you know, advice from this person and that person, and they don't know who to believe, and they don't know, you know, what direction, who should I believe, how should I really do it, and what really works. Um, all I can tell people is, I've, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and we've tried different amounts, and we've tried different products, and you know, this basically this recipe that we've come up with is what really is a foolproof recipe, and it works every time as long as you follow, you know, some basic rules. Um, the first thing you need to do is source the nitrogen that you're going to use on your bale. Now, two basic schools of thought here. One is if you're a traditional gardener, you're going to use lawn fertilizer. If you're an organic gardener, you're not going to use lawn fertilizer because you know, that's a chemical-based, it's a, it's a man-synthesized um, form of nitrogen. Instead, you're going to find an organic source of nitrogen. If, you're, if you want your vegetables or whatever you grow in it to be certifiable organic, you need to find an organic source. And that's going to usually be blood meal, is what I usually recommend to people. It has a really high percentage of nitrogen by weight or by volume of product, um, it, it's just what it says. It's dried animal blood is really what it is. And I know it sounds gross, but, you know, it's been dried and heat and sterilized. So there's not going to be any disease or anything like that in it. Um, it can be kind of expensive, which is kind of one of the drawbacks. If you want to do it organically, unfortunately, it can be kind of expensive because you need a lot of the material because it's less concentrated than fertilizer. And it tends to cost more per, per pound that you're going to use. Um, Blood meal works really well. Also, organic sources 
things like feather meal is another good source. That's about 8 to 12% nitrogen, where lead meal is usually about 15% nitrogen. So it's the highest nitrogen source. And it's a protein that when proteins decompose and you know, when microbes go to work on proteins, um, there's a whole chemical process that they go through. But if they break that protein down, you'll see they release two, two main elements. One is ammonia, and you'll smell that ammonia. It smells like ammonia in your garden, and they release nitrogen. And that nitrogen is what we're after to feed the bacteria. Now, the traditional gardener is just going to go to the local hardware store or wherever they shop, and they're going to get a bag of the cheapest lawn fertilizer, lawn food, that they can find. Um, we're looking for something here that doesn't have any kind of herbicides. We don't want any pre-emergent crabgrass control or, you know, weed and feed or anything like that. I usually tell people to look for a bag that has at least 20% nitrogen. There's always three numbers on every bag of fertilizer. The first number is always the percentage of nitrogen in that bag. And also try to find something that doesn't have a real high percentage of that nitrogen in what we call slow-release form. And usually those fertilizers are going to be more expensive. Um, you know, the name brands and the ones that are more expensive are going to be slow release. So the cheapest one is usually the one that works best for our purposes. And you're going to need, if you're buying traditional lawn fertilizer, you're going to need about one pound of lawn fertilizer for every bale that you're going to treat. So if you're doing 10 bales, you're going to need about 10 pounds, something like that. Pretty close. And then you're going to also need one tiny little bag of a 10-10-10, just a general garden fertilizer, not a lawn fertilizer, but a garden fertilizer, a 10-10-10, or a 20-20-20 or something like that, a balanced fertilizer. If you're organic, you're going to need about six times that much. So for every bale, you're going to need between five and six pounds um, of blood meal. Now, when you go to price that out, you're going to be shocked at how expensive it is. So here's what, what people should do is, Buy it in bulk. Go to your local farmer's elevator, and you'll see that they sell this by the 50-pound bag. A normal garden center, regular in-town garden center, is not going to sell that kind of volume because they don't have customers that normally need that kind of volume. But I'll tell you, if you shop around a little bit, you'll get a lot better deal on it from a farmer's elevator near you. Um, and you can get a lot of volume that way and you know, at a lot less per pound price. Hmm. So that's about how much you need. So in order to begin the process, um, you know, you're going to set your bales up and orient them. What, what I usually recommend to people is that you just put them end to end, make a row out of them because we're going to plant the top of the bales and the sides. So if you put them next to each other, now you've just eliminated two sides, uh, one side of each of two bales. So, you know, having them in a long row gives you the most planting surface, um, that, that you can fill in with plants. So I like to keep the rows a minimum of four and a half feet apart. The wider between the rows, the better, because your plants above these bales are going to get really tight. You're going to get seven foot tomatoes above there, and that's going to cast a long shadow next to that tomato in the morning and again in the afternoon. So any plants in that shadow are, of course, going to be a, you know, a little bit short of sun, and therefore they're not going to grow as well. So if you get the most efficiency, spread the rows apart bales all in a single row, and then begin the process of adding your nitrogen source. If you're doing traditional gardening using the lawn fertilizer, you're going to start up, start out using half a cup per bale. Just sprinkle it right down the middle of the bale, kind of to the edges and to the ends, and then use your sprayer into your hose to really wash that fertilizer down into the bale. As soon as you see water coming out the bottom of the bale, you can stop watering because the bale will only hold so much water. After that, it's just going to start running out the bottom. Um, so it takes a minute or a couple minutes to wash that fertilizer down in. And if you're using the blood meal, you're going to start out using three cups on each bale and water that down in. So you do that on day number one. Day number two is all you do is water the bales. Just keep them nice and wet. And I always encourage people, if you can access a bucket of warm water. So today I fill up a bucket with my hose, and the water is really cold when I run it in there. But by tomorrow, the same time, it's had 24 hours, so it's now warmed up to air temperature. So instead of being 50 degrees coming out the tap, it's now 70 degrees or whatever the temperature is outside. So that water is a little bit warmer. If you use really cold water, it you know it can slow down the, the progression of the buildup of these bacteria in the bale, which is really what we're after. Um, day number two, we just water. Day number three, we do another half cup. If it's blood meal, we do another three cups. Day number uh, four, we just water. 
Day number five, we do the same thing again, another half cup or three cups. And when you're doing the blood meal in particular, you're going to see there might be an accumulation on the surface of the bales. It's hard to get all that blood meal work down in. Don't worry about that. Just keep adding the blood meal. You know, it looks like it's not working down in there. The fine little particles, which is really where, you know, it, we're, what we want to wash down in there. The big chunks will stay on the top, but that's fine. Um, just keep adding it and washing it down in. Eventually, when this bale starts to decompose, every time you water, every time you plant something in there, you're going to kick a little bit more of that blood meal down into the bale, and it's going to continue to fertilize. So it's sort of like a slow-release process from the top of the bale. Um, so it works fine. And then we cut the rate in half. Day number six, we, we just water. And then day seven, eight, and nine, we add fertilizer on each day. If you're doing lawn fertilizer, you're going to use a quarter cup, so we cut the rate in half. If you're doing blood meal, you're going to use a cup and a half every day. Um, and after the 10-day period, day 11, I always say, uh, get ready to plant, go shopping if you need to buy transplants, that kind of stuff. And by day number 12, you're going to be pretty much ready to plant. Um, especially if you've done it using a lawn fertilizer. And if it's been halfway good weather, nice and warm during the process, your bales will be well decomposed. And you'll be able to tell that you're ready to plant because the temperature of the bales will have fallen. During the process where you're conditioning them, it can oftentimes get 150 degrees inside the bales. But then wow. that temperature will fall off. When the temperature drops and gets under 105 degrees, now you know it's okay to plant. What that's really telling us is that the bacteria colony inside that bale has um, established, they've colonized the bale, and they've, they're done with their active consuming of that free nitrogen that you've been adding, and now they've started to work on the bale itself. So now instead of taking on nitrogen, now they're going to start giving off nitrogen. And that's when we know the bale's conditioned and it's okay to plant into that bale. Well, that's the process, basically. That's very simple. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not a daunting thing, but... You know, I get emails from people all the time, oh, I read about this, and I heard about this, and I tried it, and I didn't have very much success. And it always, almost always comes back to, you know, what did you add, when, and how much, and, you know, it's usually that conditioning period, that first 10-day period, and it usually comes down to they didn't use enough nitrogen, um, because we're not fertilizing plants here, you know, with this nitrogen. What we're doing is we're starting decomposition with yeah. this nitrogen. It's a different so, mindset. It, right. It's a different, it, it's doing something different than we're familiar with as gardeners fertilizing plants. You know, we, we normally we're going to give plants a little bit of nitrogen at a time over a long period of time and lesser amount because plant, the plant itself isn't going to consume a whole lot of nitrogen real quickly, like what we're adding. What we're doing, however, is we're not feeding plants, we're feeding bacteria. Hmm. And those little suckers, you can't see them with the human eye, so... A lot of times it's hard for us to imagine how many of them there are in that bale, but by the time you're done, that bale is going to be colonized literally by billions of little bacteria mm. inside that bale. So and we're like a microbiologist, basically. Yeah, exactly. You're like a microbiologist. Now, there'll be other things inside that bale, too, working for Mother Nature. There's worms doing their part, and there's going to be insects in there doing their part to help with decomposition. And then there's going to be fungi, there's going to be mushrooms that will grow on the outside of the bale. And those mushrooms send their little mycelium, their little, for lack of better terms, little mushroom roots that go down inside the bale. And those mushrooms are also helping to decompose that inside of that bale. All these things kind of work in synergy to turn that straw into soil inside of that bale. Um, and I, I tell people, you know, on day number 12, when they go to plant and they go out to the garden and they got their little hand trowel and they dig a little hole inside that bale and they pull the bale apart and they look down inside there, they're going to think to themselves, I think this guy is nuts. This hasn't turned into compost inside of this bale. It still looks like a straw bale inside of here. And it will. And I tell people, you haven't done anything wrong. Don't panic that you forgot something or you didn't do something right. It's still going to look like a straw bale inside there. But if you looked real carefully with a microscope, with a magnifying glass, you'd see little tiny black speckles down inside that bale. And those black specks, they look almost like somebody shook pepper down inside your bale. That's just the beginnings of the development, the creation of soil. And that's a good sign. It's a sign that this, this bale has converted and it's now, you know, being decomposed. We could wait until that whole bale has completely decomposed and then plant. Our plants would do fine. But as long as that bale has met what we call the nitrogen sink reversal point where it's no longer using nitrogen in the bacteria. Instead, those bacteria have 
start giving off nitrogen, it's okay to plant into that environment. And that gives us the advantage of taking advantage of this heat that's going to continue to be given off by this bacteria as they're decomposing that bale. That's interesting. You know, the the thing that I keep uh, thinking of as as you're talking about this, earlier today you were talking about this gentleman that had tomatoes that weren't producing. They had great yeah. leaves, but they, they weren't producing fruit. Um, right. And you said, well, why don't you say what you said? Because I thought it was a very interesting piece of feedback, and it's to- so counterintuitive that I think right. until people can wrap their minds around this, it's a great illustration of how important this step is in the process. Right. Well, normally, I mean, if you were to Google, my tomatoes are growing like crazy, but they're not producing fruit. What everybody will reference to is it's an environment where there's too much nitrogen, because that's exactly what too much nitrogen will cause. There's lots of vine growth, but it won't set fruit very well. Um, there's a lot of things that can cause tomatoes to not set fruit. You know, they'll blossom, but they don't set the fruit. But what I'm contending with him, is, and based on how he conditioned his bales, is that he didn't use enough nitrogen early on in the process to feed the bacteria enough to develop the col- and colonize the bale to for the, the bacteria to then decompose that bale. Now, when it decomposes the bale, inside of trapped inside of these straw particles. Um, you know, are all kinds of micronutrients. You know, when that oats or wheat plant grew, it took nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the three main building blocks, but it also took a whole bunch of micronutrients to build that oats plant or that wheat plant. So trapped in that stem somewhere is a little bit of zinc and a little molybdenum and some iron and all these little micronutrients that plants need to properly develop. So once that bacteria is developed enough and it decomposes the straw and makes soil, now all of those micronutrients become available. So now when he puts his tomato in there, the tomato is going to get plenty of nitrogen, but it's also going to get all these other micronutrients that it needs in order to set fruit to properly flower and properly set fruit. Um, But what he did is he just added a little bit of nitrogen, almost like he was growing the tomatoes in a hydroponic environment inside the bale. So he was giving it enough, just enough water and enough fertilizer to make, to keep the roots wet and with, with enough nitrogen on the roots that he caused this um, to express itself in lots of vine growth, but no fruit set. The main reason because he was only adding nitrogen and there were none of these other micronutrients because he hadn't added enough nitrogen early on to activate the bacteria to do the decomposition. So, you know, people grow stuff hydroponically all the time. So you don't have to have soil. You just have to have all of these micro and macronutrients available for the roots of these plants. And that's essentially what I'm contending he did, except he didn't have the micronutrients. He was just giving uh, uh, only um, the only source of nutrient was um, his organic nitrogen. And it didn't have any micronutrients. So... It probably is that, you know, there can be other reasons that tomatoes don't set fruit, too. If it gets over 90 degrees, when your tomato blossoms, it won't set fruit, typically. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if he planted too late, which he may have done because he didn't condition early enough and the bales weren't ready early enough because he didn't put enough nitrogen on them, which means he delayed planting too long. And if you plant too late, your tomatoes flower too late when we have a hot weather period, and therefore they don't set fruit or not as many fruit as they should. Yeah. Lots of ways to play tomato detective, aren't there? Yes, indeed. And, you know, you'll get all kinds of confusing advice if you try to look online, uh, that kind of thing. But usually if, if somebody goes through their step-by-step and writes everything down and they can repeat back to me what they did, you know, usually you can figure out where, if you've done this enough times, kind of where they made their misstep and, yeah. and probably what caused the problem. Bottom line, if they follow the instructions, whether they go the traditional route or the organic route, within two weeks, they're ready to go. Yes. Yeah. From your lips to their ears. That's right. If they follow the process. If they yes. follow the process, just yes. follow and the I, steps. I, right. And I do tell people, you know, the greatest way to tell if your bales are ready is just steal your digital meat thermometer out of the kitchen and punch it in the side of the bales. And as long as the temperature on day number 12 has dropped below 105 degrees at the depth of that meat thermometer from the top of the sides, you're ready to plant. Now, if you don't have a meat thermometer, just stick your hand down in the bale because most of us, our hand should be about 100 degrees if we're not sick. Um, you stick your hand down in that bale and it feels hot on your hand, it's too hot to plant. But mm. if it feels comfortable or cool against your hand, 
it's below 105 degrees and it's okay to go ahead and put your, your vegetable transplants in the bale on day number 12. Sometimes if the weather has been cooler and the bales haven't progressed quickly enough, it might take 13 or 14 days before you can plant. But 12 is a really good target for most okay. people in most parts of the country. You know, average bales, average weather following this process, um, you're going to be ready in two weeks and 12 days. Yep. And it's all laid out in your book. So it's very step-by-step. Yep. Step. It really is easy. Now, um, one of the things I admire most about how you instruct folks um, to set up their straw bale garden, the actual physical process of it, is the greenhouse effect that you create with the tent cover or the row cover in warmer areas. And I think how you set this up is pretty ingenious. And I, I realize it might be hard for folks to envision, but can you kind of visually describe your setup in such a way that people can understand this best practice that you've developed sure. with the posts and the wire? I will do the best I can. Okay. Um, you're going to need just a couple of supplies, and I always send people to, if you have a like a fleet store around you, someplace that is oriented towards the farming community and agriculture community, that's a good place to go because you want to buy steel fence posts. And sometimes when you buy them at the local garden center or at the local hardware store, they're just going to have the flimsy little the little metal ones are not the big, strong, what we call T-posts, which is really what you're looking for. Um, so you're going to get the tallest T-post, fence post, that they sell at your local farm store. And you're going to need one of those for each end of, your, of each row of bales that you set up. Um, couldn't be simpler. Call, first of all, to make sure you don't have any utilities when you start pounding in posts. But um, pound, pound the post in at the end of each row of bales, um, there'll be a flange on the bottom of the post that sticks out. You just want to pound so that flange gets level with the soil. That flange is going to help sort of secure the post in the ground so it doesn't tip over. And then we get electric fence wire, also from the same store, uh, amazingly, um, that farmers usually use to fence off their pastures. This stuff is really cheap. Um, the problem is they, they never sell it by the feet. They only sell it by a quarter of a mile increments. So when you buy one of the smallest rolls they sell, you're going to have enough wire for you and all your neighbors uh, to do all your straw bale gardens. But it's, it's usually relatively inexpensive. So get some. I always recommend 14-gauge, if you can find it, 14-gauge wire. That seems to work best. If you get too thin, the wire will cut the plant tissue. If you get too thick, it just gets hard to work with. So 14-gauge wire seems to work best. And we stretch it back and forth. Um, between these posts, you know, tie the wire off at each end, and we give all the spacing and exact, that kind of stuff in the book. But essentially, we want to start out our row of wires 10 inches above the bale. We're going to put two stretches of wire across, so a pair of wires from one post to the other. And then another 10 inches above that, two more wires. And then we go single wires all the way up the post until we get to the top. Now, between the tops of the fence posts, to hold the posts apart, when you start tightening these wires, it's going to want to bend those posts towards each other. So what I suggest is that people put a, literally a board, like a two-by-four, a two-by-six, from one post to the other post. Um, and we show you in the book a little way you can cut the ends of the board so it slides over the, the posts and makes it really super easy. But you can figure out a way to just fasten it to the post to hold those posts apart from each other. So you tighten the wires up nice and tight. Now you've got this almost like a an espalier system or a trellis system built above your bales. And what we do with the greenhouse effect is when, when we first transplant, usually what we're going to do is we're going to transplant just before, maybe a few days before our average last frost date. And I know that makes gardeners shiver in their boots when you do that because they're nervous that they're going to lose their plants. But we put our tomatoes, our, our cucumbers, other warm season crops into that bale and then through that double wire, the one that's 10 inches above the bale, we run a little plastic, you can use 3 mil poly that you can buy essentially anywhere at the home center, or we use um, row cover, vegetable row cover, floating row cover, and run it through those wires, bring it down along the sides of the bales, and tuck it underneath the strings along the sides of the bales, and leave it covering the bales on any time it's cool or cold night, and then when it's warm and sunny during the day, you just take that row cover and slide it to the end and wrap it around the post, kind of like a shower curtain to get it out of the way, and leave your plants, plants exposed. Now, if there's forecast for a cold night, you just run out and pull it back over the top, and it makes this little tent over the top. If your plants get too tall, which is why we have another set of wires at 20 inches, 
just move that plastic up from the 10 inch level to the 20 inch level. And by that time, it's going to easily be three weeks down the road. You're going to be into the first week in June and there's no chance of frost. So you can pull your poly covers or your vegetable row cover covers off. And now all that wire is going to serve as a support for your peas and your beans, obviously, but then for other plants as well, you know, your peppers, normally we wouldn't stake peppers, but you'll see they really, it's a real advantage to them to have these wires there um, that you can kind of work the, the branches back and forth amongst these wires and it really helps support those plants. So it serves a couple of purposes setting up that espalier wire. Um, I really encourage people to do it. And, you know, for the cost of one really big, nice tomato cage that you buy at a garden center, you can buy two fence posts and the wire to do a, you know, a five bale garden for the same price for, you know, 15 bucks. So wow. really an expensive way to do it. This is what the city kids don't know, Joel. Yes, I know. <laughs> but it does, it, it's super easy and it works really well. Uh, one little hint for people too. If you buy these fence posts, they're hard to pound in the ground. So what you need to get, you can either buy one for 15 bucks or you can rent one at the rental center, probably for a couple dollars for an hour, is a post pounder. It's this special tool that slides up like a big giant pen cap over top of the post, has handles on the side, you lift it up and you slam it down. It makes it really easy to pound those posts in. Um, if you're standing out there with your stepladder and a sledgehammer, somebody's going to get hurt and it's probably going to be you. Yes. So, um, it's always, yeah, be careful if you're doing it that way. Instead, get a post pounder. They go in really super easy that way. Okay. So when you say super easy, you're talking to someone who has like no upper body strength. Even I could do it? Yes. I guarantee even you could do it. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to be doing it this spring, so I will definitely let you know. <laughs> You'll call me. Get over here. Exactly. Well, before we go, I want to give you a chance to talk about something that I know you're passionate about, and that is that folks have their own garden. Do you want to chat about that quickly before we head out? You know, it's just one thing I've seen in our in our society in general that I really think, you know, people talk about why should I have my own garden? I can go to the farmer's market. I can go down to the grocery store and buy beautiful produce, right? The grocery store. But here's what happens if you go to the grocery store. And I guarantee you, Jennifer, you've done this too. When you go to the grocery store and you go to the tomatoes, you're going to sort through those tomatoes. Any tomato on that pile that has a single blemish on it, you're not going to put that in your basket and take it home with you. So what ends up happening is, those tomatoes with the little blemish on end up going back to the, dis- to the distributor and the distributor brings, you know, essentially they go back to the grower and the distributor tells the grower, don't send me any more tomatoes with a blemish on them because nobody buys those and they end up getting thrown away. And so now the grower tells his pickers, you know what, don't pick any of those tomatoes that have a little blemish on them, throw those in the garbage. So now we wonder why we're throwing away literally almost half of all of our production gets you know, tossed in the garbage bin because it's not perfect looking. Now, as soon as you grow your own tomato plant in your own backyard, you're going to go out after spending three months watering and fertilizing and taking care of this tomato, and you're going to get a tomato that you pick off there that has a little blemish on it, but guess what? You're going to just cut around that blemish, and you're going to eat that tomato, and you're going to realize that you didn't die from eating it, and it tasted pretty darn good. And maybe it'll change your attitude the next time you go to the grocery store you won't be quite as picky because you know just because that vegetable, whatever it is, has a little tiny mark on it doesn't mean that you can't eat it, that somehow it's going to hurt you or poison you. And it's just sort of re-educating people and, you know, helping people understand how difficult it is to produce these vegetables and how, you know, we shouldn't be wasteful and, and we should be more respectful of this great crop that people put in front of us and the work they mm-hmm. put into it and, you know, I think that can happen if people spend even a part of their year growing their own food supply. Um, but just the benefits that you get by doing it and you get to be outside and you get better produce and it tastes better and it's fresher and you know, all those advantages. But I think there's an underlying sort of sentiment, uh, an underlying attitude that we can change in people's uh, view of how they view their food supply, how they view particularly their produce. Uh, that they buy at their their own local store, and if I, if we accomplish nothing else, letting someone experience growing their own food in their own backyard, even on a limited basis, I think we can really influence that aspect of of the marketplace, which which would be huge. Mm-hmm. You know, it would change the dynamic significantly um, around the world in terms of what people eat and 
how healthy they are and what they buy and, you know, everything. Well said. Well said. Well, that's it for our show this week. I want to thank Joel for being such a fabulous guest. He's coming back next week, and we're going to wrap up this whole focus on straw bale gardening, and he's going to take us through his top tips and suggestions for growing vegetables in straw bale gardens. You won't want to miss it. It'll be a great wrap-up to this series. I want to thank you for listening to the show today. Don't forget, I appreciate any of you that can spare the time to go to iTunes and leave a review for the show so that others can find this podcast. And if you do that, I will be happy to give you a shout out on the show next week. Of course, I'll have all the information from the show today at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under Still Growing Podcast. You can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash stillgrowingwithsixfootmama. You can also email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Well, this past week, I was at a thrift sale and I came across an old book entitled Things Beautiful and it's copyright 1911 and it's by Samuel Francis Woolard. And I had Will and Emma go through the book to select a few poems to share with us today. Emma, you picked a selection from this book, and what is it called? I Know the Way of the Wild Blush Rose. You picked that one, and why did you pick that? Because rose has something to do with garden. Okay, so you were looking for something kind of gardening related, and you found this one. Guess so. Okay, you want to read it? Sure. I know the way of the wild blush rose. I know the way of the wild blush rose that blooms in the coppice there. The wild blush rose whose beauty glows in the languid summer air. For oh, she loves to be wooed in one. And she opens her heart to the ardent sun. And she tells her love well, yet she may. For love doth last but a summer's day. I know the way of the nightingale. In the dark green ilex tree, for each pure note from her pulsing throat breathes love's wild ecstasy. 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 She sings that her listening swain may know the tender rapture that moves her so. For soon, too soon, the leaf grows sere, and love will pass with the passing year. But who can know the way of a maid when her heart is sweetly thrilled? Deep down in her eyes the secret lies, and the song on her lips is still. But locked in love's first dear embrace, a new light shines on her upturned face. There's a song in her breast that she'll ever stay, for the love of a maid is A and A, by Willard Emerson Keys. Part of that I don't even understand. Okay, and the last one Emma will read is this selection called Knowledge by Theodosia Garrison. I have known sorrow, therefore I may laugh with you, O friend, more merrily than those who never sorrowed upon earth, and know not laughter's worth. I have known laughter. Therefore, I may sorrow with you far more tenderly than those who never knew how sad a thing seems merriment to one heart suffering. Okay, Will is here. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing today? Thank you, Will. Yeah, Sunday night. Very tired, but yeah. We got all your homework done, though, so that's a good thing. Big debate tomorrow. You have a debate tomorrow? Yes. Can you stop talking like that? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just really tired. So your selection is called The Rainy Day by H.W. Longfellow. And November has been very rainy this year, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay, why don't you read this poem? The day is cold and the dark is dreary. It. What? Oh. The dark is not dreary. That's not what it says. Yeah, it does. Dar- and dark oh. and dreary. 
The day is cold and dark and dreary. It rains and the wind is never weary. The vine still clings to the moldering wall, but at every gust the dead leaves fall, and the day is dark and dreary. My life is cold and dark and dreary. It rains and the cold wind is never weary. My thoughts still cling to the moldering past, but but the hopes of youth fall thick in the blast, and the days are dark and dreary. Be still, sad heart, and cease repining. Behind the clouds is the sun still shining. Thy fate is the common fate of all. Into each life some rain must fall. Some days must be dark and dreary. H. W. Longfellow. All right, and then this last one is called The Joy of Pretense. Let's dream like the child and its playing. Let's make us a sky and a sea. Let's change the things around us by saying their things as we wish them to be. And if there is sadness or sorrow, let's dream till we charm it away. Let's learn from the children and borrow and saying from childhood, let's play. A saying from childhood. Let's, let's play. play. You got to say a saying. A saying from childhood, let's play. Let's play that the world's full of beauty. Let's play there are roses in bloom. Let's play there is pleasure and duty and light where we thought there was a gloom. No, where we thought there was gloom. Oh, does that have to be perfect? There was and light where we thought there was gloom. Let's play that this heart with its sorrow is bidden be joyous and glad. Let's play that we'll find on the morrow, morrow. morrow the joys that we never have had. Let's play we have done with repining. Let's play we have done with repining. Let's play that our longings are still. Well, you have to say it. I'm saying it. I know you have to re-say this. It's repining. Oh, my, oh my God. Let's play we have done with repining. Let's play that our longings are still. Let's play that the sunlight is shining to guide, I mean, to gild the green slope of the hill. Let's play there are birds blithery flinging. Blithely flinging. Okay. Let's play there are birds blithely flinging. There are songs of delight to the air. Let's play that the world's full of singing. Let's play there is love everywhere. Bye, Anonymous. Bye, Anonymous.